Welcome to another program in our series on Free Thinking Forum. I have another uh, uh, guest today. Uh, I had invited your uh, president, Dane Smith, again, but I have the pleasure of getting to know Maureen Ramirez. Yes. Uh, the Director of Research, uh, of Policy and Research. Yes. And Maureen, you, you have experience as a Board of Regents also, a member of the Board of Regents. How, how did this come about? Uh, that's right. Most of my background is in higher education. And that background really started in 2001. I got my first job. I started working at the University of Minnesota. I was an admissions counselor, a freshman admissions counselor, visiting high schools and talking to students about the U of M. Um, after that, I did that for a few years, uh, and then I was an advisor on campus helping students to graduate. And I learned about the U, I learned about the challenges students were facing when they were going through. I was there when they closed the general college. And then I went back to school uh, and did a master's degree at University of Minnesota Duluth. It's the master's in advocacy and political leadership. And when I was doing that, I was eligible to run for the Board of Regents. The regents are the governing board for the mm -hmm. university, the way a school board governs a school district or a board of directors oversees a company. But the, for the University of Minnesota, one of their seats on the board of regents has to be held by a student at the time of election. And so while I was a student, that seat was open and I ran for it. And there were others running? And there were others running, yep. It's a competitive process. Uh, the Board of Regents gets elected by the state legislature. It's the only thing they do in joint session, the House and the Senate come together and cast their votes for the Board of the University of Minnesota. And um, you had to start out by filling out an application. There's a citizen review board. It's called the Regent Candidate Advisory Council. They have primary responsibility for screening applications, selecting people for an interview and forwarding names from the interview onto the legislature. And so in 2007, I was a student, and that's when I was doing it. Well, that's a great preparation for what you're doing now, I bet. It is, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a, I say it was like a combination of running an issue campaign at the legislature, which I had some experience doing, and a candidate campaign, because instead of going to visit offices and telling legislators to vote for a bill, I had to walk in and say, vote for me. And, <laughs> and wow. that was an adjustment. I bet. Yeah. Yes. And w were you surprised? What, what surprised you about the Board of Regents? Well, I got elected to the board having worked at the University of Minnesota for six years, mostly working with low-income students. And so first you knew far more than most regents <laughs> when they were appointed. Uh, I knew definitely about the some of the ins and outs for students and their journey through the university, right? Especially immigrant students, low-income students, first-generation students. Um, I expected the board to, to have more to do with students' everyday experience, but really at a place that big, it's about a $3 billion budget. There were so many, many things about running an organization that big. Um, that it wasn't necessarily as much about the students as I had imagined. And I don't think that's bad. I think the, at Maybe. the oversight level, there's a lot to take care of. Um, so one example is when I first got on was 2007. Well, that was just when the light rail was being planned through campus. Oh, and the rumbling of the... Yes, the, uh, next to the magnetic uh, the research, yep. Yeah, the physics Facilities, yep. And the, um, so the university first was requesting a tunnel was also requesting the northern alignment that instead mm -hmm. of going on Washington, it would go back behind so where you, the stadium you got a was. Vote on the so I did, yes, and and uh, so my first two years on the board were really dominated by transportation. Really. And what is it like to put a train through campus? Because there's competing priorities. There's investments you've already made in research infrastructure that you want to protect, and uh, then there's trying to work with the Met Council to come to an agreement about what's really going to be the right kind of train for campus. Yeah, so we, we spent a lot of time. Oh, were you successful? I was successful in learning a lot about the <laughs> university. Uh, yeah. And in um, 
you know, making good colleagues um, and asking good questions. Um, I think being a, a, a voice, a different kind of voice at that, at that table. But the physics uh, department doesn't uh, vibrate now? Doesn't shake, no. So some of the magnets that were in the facility got moved over to the, the biosciences, the new facility mm -hmm. um, developed behind the stadium. So they moved some of those and then still worked out a mitigation plan. Uh, they also put the floating slab underneath. The floating slab, Do you yes. remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I have so much fun when I ride on the train now because when we when I ride on it through campus I think now I'm on the floating slab and I think <laughs> I know a little more about it you know than otherwise but I feel a lot Absolutely. more connected. Were there other challenges uh, on the University Board of Regents? Uh, one of the challenges that was just a situation I was there when we hired the new president so President Brunix indicated he was ready to step down and retire. And so the board uh, mobilized and went through the process that it had to find a new president and do that whole search. And so I feel real fortunate w to have been there. Were you on the search committee? So I wasn't on the search committee. The board appointed a, a committee of citizens that had one regent, uh, Regent Patty Simmons, huh. was the liaison between that committee and the board. Um, in order to follow process and mm -hmm. stay with all of the um, Data Practices Act and uh, open meeting laws, the one region got appointed there and then we heard back uh, through the process. Did you accept the first recommendation? Uh, well, I accepted the, the ultimate recommendation of the committee, which was the forwarded Dr. Eric Kaler. And, and he's there now. And he's there now, yes. Good. So you made a good selection. <laughs> yes. And you know, I had really underestimated how much one person could change an institution that big. So I was there during two presidents. And um, just the tone of the place and, and the culture of it a little bit really uh, makes a difference who that person is. Things went a little differently and uh, continue to be different at the university with President Kaler. And I think that's good. I think that's good for the U. Good. Well, now you, you've got a tremendous responsibility for the growth and justice in the state of Minnesota. Yes, at the same time. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the hard part. <laughs> I, I, I've interviewed Dane Smith, the president of Growth and Justice, but uh, uh, first time I've gotten into policy and research. Yes. That's your bailiwick. That's my area, yes. And Dane and I work together quite a bit. Um, he's got expertise in tax policy and transportation and certainly has been doing politics and policy for quite a long time. Uh, I have more background in higher ed, also in K-12 and a little bit in workforce. Mm -hmm. And, and so we, most of us know him, uh, uh, older folks all know him uh, from his days at the Star Tribune. Yeah, as a writer. Uh, and I was really happy to go to work for a, a good writer. That was important to me. And certainly I've seen a lot of good publications coming out. Uh, the the uh, Growth and Justice, uh, Widening Economic Inequality in Minnesota, uh, uh, The Causes, Effects, and a Proposal for Estimating Its Impact on Policy Making. Uh, that's one paper, and then yep. you, uh, uh, we have a, a picture of a map. We do. We have the second um, version. This was our first report, um, and our authors here were Jay Coggins and Tom Legg. They're professors at the University of Minnesota um, with Dane Smith. Um, this one first laid out economic inequality, um, but our second, more recent report was Tom Legg and Jenny Wynn, and they... Um, did an analysis. Do, do you have the map Do I have there? it? Mm, I do not. Oh, wow. Let's get it up on the screen. <laughs> there we oh, go. Oh, there you go. Uh, so, oh, I'm showing through there. I think I am too. Uh, because there's, uh, there's green on the map. <laughs> oh, so it's, well. Uh, so. so what you can see, maybe on the maps, maybe not, is this analysis of counties in Minnesota shows that the most unequal counties are in greater Minnesota and in Hennepin and Ramsey. Mm -hmm. 
And the circle of counties right around Hennepin and, Ram Hennepin and Ramsey have the most equal income levels inside those counties. So there's kind of this donut around the... The, the donut of the metro suburbs. Yep, of the suburbs to the exurbs. Yep, you know, Dakota, Scott. And, and exurbs. Yep, yep. Washington. Um, that those counties have much more equality when it comes to income inside of them and that the greater disparities are seen on the inside. In Hennepin County and, and Ramsey, Ramsey County. Yep. And then across greater Minnesota. And that's called the Gini coefficient? Yeah, so G -I -N -I? the G-I-N-I? G-I-N-I, after an Italian guy, yes. Uh, that measures the inequality inside of. So these maps mean that we see a lot more uh, difference in the income levels within Hennepin County and Ramsey, as well as some outstate yes. uh, counties yep. uh, than we do in the donut uh, around the central cities. Yep, suggesting that perhaps the urban counties have more in common with greater Minnesota counties than they might imagine that the mm -hmm. disparities that they see, that the some very high and some very low incomes uh, in those counties you know, might give them some common cause with each other. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like folks to take a look at that map again. Um, uh, let's see, can we bring it up? Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> let's talk about uh, one of the other projects that you're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, HF 1676 and Senate file 1276, the Educational Partnerships Fund. Will you tell us about that? Yeah, this was a focus of a lot of our activity at the legislature this year. And this came about because we're working in greater Minnesota on some, with some communities that have these educational collaboratives happening. Mm -hmm. Um, you or your viewers might be familiar with Generation Next in the Twin Cities that's headed by R.T. Rybeck. Oh, yes. And it's a collaborative, a cross-sector group that's looking at education and... Um, and can folks get this online or...? Uh, yeah, they can see about the project so on here, our website. Here's what it looks like um, on, on the website. Uh, and the website is simply growth and justice with no spaces. That's right. Dot O-R-G. O -R -G, yep, yeah. and and spelled out. Um, so the Twin Cities Educational Partnership Collaborative is called Generation Next, but there's communities in greater Minnesota that have similar collaboratives that have some been happening mm -hmm. for longer, some are newer, and these are in Austin, Red Wing, Northfield, the Itasca area, and St. Cloud. And this is a national model for this kind of collaboration. And it, these are the goals, I see. Yeah, so each community has identified its own goals. These are basically hold true across the, the set. All children are ready for school. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that is a really That's a important challenge. All third graders goal. can read at grade level. All racial and economic achievement gaps between students are closed. All students are ready for career and college. All students graduate from high school. Yep, and then each individual initiative has supplemented some of those goals. Um, Itasca area has done a lot of work on out of school time and also emotional and mental supports for students mm. and developmental outcomes, not just academic outcomes. Uh, a few of the other initiatives have taken an approach like that as well. That sounds like a couple of important uh, additions to that list. Yes, yes, because this list seems pretty academic, and when you talk to educators, they will tell you it's not strictly academic, and having uh, supportive adults in a child's life is also a metric to measure, and finding ways to support students and mentors, all those things make a difference as well. Now, how, how, would, they, uh, how would the viewer find those additional metrics that they've added in Itasca and? Uh, uh, from each individual initiative website, you can see what their data points are and what their. So they just look up Itasca Educational Partnership 
um, or something like that? Something like that. They might have to know the specific name of each one. <laughs> uh, but that's all information that Growth and Justice is working towards collecting. And so um, this set of initiatives, uh, not all of them specifically, but these were the initiatives we had in mind when we went to the state, asking for state investment in these kind of cross-sector partnerships to say that when the community has come together, picked out their goals, made a plan to work together to reduce their achievement gaps, um, we think that's a great place for the state to target some of their some of their money. And this partnership came together with some greater Minnesota communities and here in the Twin Cities, the Northside Achievement Zone and St. Paul Promise neighborhood. So that it was a, a statewide coalition saying a local approach to this is a good approach. Mm -hmm. And um, we had bipartisan authors um, from the Senate and from the House. Representative Tim Kelly from Red Wing was our author in the House and uh, Senator Matt Schmidt from Red Wing also was our senator uh, and had some hearings. We're still in limbo since the K-12 bill hasn't been passed. Um, so we're not sure of that outcome, but we actually- Well, maybe by the time this is broadcast, we'll know. Viewers might already know, but the, the really exciting thing for me uh, was watching the urban partnerships and the rural partnerships talk to each other and they don't share all the exact same concerns Red Wing doesn't look exactly like of North Minneapolis, not. no, um, <clears throat> which is why they have some of their own individual they, goals. Well, they've modified the, yeah. the goals for that particular region. Um, but, but, you know, they all share the same dedication to students and student success. Mm -hmm. And so watching them come together, sort of recognize the commitment and dedication in the, in the other communities and then see where we had common ground, that was the no. best outcome of this coalition. So is this focused on E through 12 or K through 12? E 12, you could say. The early, yep. early childhood education yep. through 12th grade. Yep. And now you worked also on higher education. Uh, yes. Not, not just when you were a, a regent, but uh, this year. This year. <coughs> what, what happened in the legislature? Uh, this year in higher education, uh, Growth and Justice was specifically interested in uh, a bill or a provision that would set a statewide attainment goal for higher education that would say, all right, the state of Minnesota collectively believes there's a goal we can reach and there's a, <laughs> a standard that we want to set for and we believe that for workforce needs and also it can help in, I think, helping the systems differentiate themselves um, and know what they're working towards, the graduation goals they're working towards. And this actually, Growth and Justice, started um, in 2007 and 2008 in their report called Smart Investments in Minnesota Students. They suggested a statewide goal. And so now, just about eight years later, uh, we have one. In well, good. Statute for Sometimes the first time. Sometimes it takes a while to get the legislature moving. I know. It was... Uh, uh, something we're quite proud of, and um, we worked with Senator Terry Bonoff. Um, she had an idea about how to make it happen. The Lumina Foundation um, is also kind of the place that is tracking which states have done it and which haven't. I think there's about 21 states that have done it. Um, and it's really driven policy in some states when Tennessee set their goal. Um, you know, they're one of the, the states that just offered free community college mm -hmm. to every student in Tennessee. They're taking lottery funding and diverting it for free two years of college, um, which one of our legislators had the idea of doing that here. Um, Senator Stumpf proposed free mm -hmm. community college, and it didn't get passed in the version he imagined, but there is going to be a pilot program um, starting this, no, starting in two years um, for certain technical colleges and certain programs at technical colleges. Um, it's a last dollar in funding, so that means mm -hmm. the grants that the student would already be eligible for go in first, and then the state does the, the last dollar. Yep. Uh, as needed. Yep. Uh, and uh, it, a moment ago we were uh, talking about uh, something about the uh, a, uh, MFIP Yes, is that, is another, that something you worked on too? Uh, yes, we, we did. Um, we supported some MFIP legislation this year. 
um, and in previous years. This year, the request was for additional funding. MFIP, I should say, is the Minnesota Family Investment Program. Yeah. It's what you think of so, as And welfare. I see it's head co headlined Prosperity for All. Uh, yes, this is a broad coalition um, led in many ways by legal services, a legal aid services, um, the Coalition for the Homeless, and a whole set of other nonprofits. Um, what they were asking for this year was an increase to cash assistance for it. Uh, cash assistance has not gone up since 1983. Impossible. For that families. Incredible. That's a long time to. How could it? How could anybody think that income in 1983 was enough for today? For today, and so the answer is it's not. So there have been some places where some additional income streams have come in through some housing allowance dollars, uh, a transportation allowance dollars, but the basic cash grant itself has not gone up. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, it didn't pass. And, and the, the proposal was to increase it by what? $100 by $100, a month? Dollars, yep. Uh, 100 a month, and they voted it down. Yeah, and it did not, it did not pass. That, uh, that is shocking. It, it's certainly there for next year. You know, there was uh, some oh, bipartisan yeah. support. I mean, it kind of falls in the category of a number of things at the legislature this year of unfinished I think we need business. more citizens activated to yeah. get the right people representing us. Yeah, uh, I think so. So uh, we, we can talk a little more now about the uh, maps. About the maps, you can see them? Yeah. Uh, great, you can see the 2012 median income by county, uh, that gray donut right there, that's what we were talking about. And th that's the higher incomes? It's higher incomes, and yep. And then black is the least uh, Is the income. lowest, yep, yep. And orange is somewhere just below the... The, the, the gray. The gray. Yep, and But on then the, uh, the Gini coefficient uh, on the right, it shows a, a little different. Yep. And so the most desirable is to have the uh, white level. The yes, I think the and, lower. And so, for example, uh, uh, that looks like Anoka County, Wright County, uh, Chisago County, have m a more equal incomes yep. of people in those counties. Yep, and Scott County down there as well. And Scott, yeah. Uh, is that, and is that Olmsted County? Uh, that oh, do you think uh, you'd be testing my You're knowledge testing of the geography. outlines of uh, <laughs> Minnesota counties, which doesn't go much beyond the, okay. the metro area. I apologize. And then apologize. Moore, Moorhead looks like uh, that county is close the, the incomes don't don't vary as much as in the black counties. As much, yep. Yeah. But what you can see from the black counties up there in northern Minnesota, um, and even in southern Minnesota, you know, they're the same color, same level of inequality as Hennepin and Ramsey. And that might be shocking to some people. I think so. Oh. I don't think they often think of themselves as, uh, you know, fitting the same pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there is uh, more things in common between the uh, the inner ring counties and the uh, and greater uh, Minnesota and greater Minnesota counties. And I think it also suggests that income inequality is a statewide issue; that yes. it's not just something about here in the metro area. Well, good. I'm I'm glad your reports or uh, your research and policy uh, tackled this issue. Thank you. Uh, yes, we had um, uh, authors from the University of Minnesota, yep, uh, Tom Legg and Jenny Wynn, who have published and done the analysis of the counties for us. Good. Now we have about five minutes left. Okay. What else would you like to say? Uh, well, we're... Um, what, what happened in the legislature? What happened? Is, what is was there anything else? Unique? That, uh, you know, I, so I think I've, probably less happened this last year that, than any time. That's right. Yes. In a long time. Uh, actually, ever. Uh, according to House research, it was the smallest number of bills ever passed in a session 
in uh, 2015. And why was that? There are a number of things happening at the legislature this year. Uh, you know, from the elections in 2014, the House turned over. Um, I think they got 11 seats for Republicans, 10 of those in greater Minnesota. And so the House came in really with an idea about what they could do for greater Minnesota and making sure it wasn't just all about the metro mm -hmm. in the legislature. Um, everyone came in with a $2 billion surplus. And so the conversation was about what to do with it, not about cutting and just about a deficit or playing defense. Um, the Republicans made eliminating Minnesota care one of their priorities and also talked a lot about did giving. Did they do that? They did not. Ah. They did not. Um, they also talked about giving it all back, give the whole surplus back tax cuts. Um, and they didn't do that either. The Democrats, you know, the governor went in with his priorities about early childhood, um, universal pre-K. That, that sounds very important to me. The return on investment for early childhood education is phenomenal. It is, and uh, Art Rolnick has really been leading uh, mm -hmm. on that. Now his research and his proposal uh, is aimed towards scholarships and targeted funding to low-income families to use for early childhood. That's not what Dayton had in mind. He was talking universal pre-K, so four-year-olds, um, everybody. And Art was saying, uh, scholarships to some families. And that's still the debate that's happening and there's research on both sides and, and that became one of the divisive issues of the session uh, and is part of the reason there's unfinished business. Hmm. So are you looking forward uh, to next year, the, the, se the second session of this uh, legislature? Yes, you know, they will go back late. They're not scheduled to go back until March. So typically the second session is a shorter session. And, uh, and maybe the state legislative building will be ready for them by then. Yes, and uh, maybe the Capitol will be a little easier to get around. It was, it was hard to get around. It was hard to schedule committee rooms in the Capitol. The, gathering space for groups, right, for mobilized, interested people yeah. to be there was uh, not as easy. There were porta potties in the Capitol. <laughs> uh, oh. So there were some unique challenges this session that made it hard for everyone. Well, this is, we've, we've got one more minute, but I, I just want to tell you how delighted I am to meet a former Board of Region, uh, former Regent of the yep. University of Minnesota and now devoting yourself to this work of, uh, as uh, uh, Director of policy, uh, policy and Research. Yes. Uh, is there anything else that, we, that you've done that we, uh, for example, where, where did you start out? Did you start out in Minnesota? I did, I grew up here. Uh, went away to college, came back, started working at the U in 2001. Um, should tell you I have two girls uh, at oh, home. Good. Uh, one who's 11 and one who's eight. Yeah. And uh, so when I'm not working and at the legislature, I you get to spend time with them. Great. Yep. And you know what? I'm in school now too. Uh, I'm getting an MBA at Carlson. Uh, Carlson School of Management, Carlson School University of Management. Minnesota. Yep. Uh, I got a Bush Fellowship from the Bush Foundation last well, congratulations. year. Congratulations. And I'm using that. Well, good. We'll look forward to your coming back uh, with even more wisdom. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, All thank right. you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, uh, come back uh, next week about the same time, and uh, we'll probably be on, too, with another guest. <laughs>